Welcome back to the vlog. This is episode 50, which seems like a big deal to me, so what better place to film a vlog? This is Las Vegas, Nevada. Truth is, I'm here for pretty much no reason other than the fact that I was getting a little burned out with the usual grind and my girlfriend kind of agreed so we decided why not make a last minute decision to take a trip somewhere. Are you gonna pop in here? <laughs> anyway, yeah, so we're just here for a few days and really have no plans aside from checking out the city, finding some cool spots to eat and of course a little bit of poker is unavoidable. So I figured if I'm only gonna play a bit, why not make a session purely dedicated to a poker room that I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard lots of things about, but I actually haven't covered yet. And that is the win slash encore that I figured I'm um, due for giving my thoughts on it. So here it goes. Starting off with the pros. Number one is gonna be the materials in this place are pretty much top notch. And that includes the chips, the felt, the seats, the tables, actually pretty much anything. Secondly, the decorations are also incredible. The room is beautiful. It's also very spacious and it's just an overall very relaxing place to hang out. On top of that, one more thing, the lighting is very good, which at some other poker rooms, obviously that's not the case sometimes, but at the win, it's, it's very bright in there, which is not very common for a poker room. Also, the dealers and staff are top notch. Everyone's very friendly, very professional, and just very good at their job. Another thing is that the wind doesn't charge for parking. At the Bellagio and Aria, and actually just most places around the strip, you have to pay to park for the day, but the wind said, nah, free parking. Something else I thought was pretty cool is they have designated bathrooms specifically for the poker room, which isn't something you see often, and it's definitely convenient. Another thing is they have mobile chargers for rent right there in the room. As for the poker itself, they offer really deep buy-ins relative to the rest of the city. So the 1.3 is a 500 cap and the 2.5 is a 1500 cap. So these are some of the deeper buy-ins that you'll see pretty much anywhere. And it's something I'm a big fan of. On top of that, they offer a bunch of different games and very high stakes. So for those of you guys out there who like to grind some really big games, you'll probably find them here, no problem. However, a lot of these pros kind of tie into the major con for this room, which is that it's really infested with regs and pros. I guess that's just natural. When the room is as good as it is, it's gonna attract a lot of the best players from around the city to spend most of their time at. So as a result, the main bad thing about this room is that the games are not great. In fact, they're not really soft from what I've seen, even as low as the 1-3 limit, which is the lowest they offer. There's really not a ton of bad players. I mean, obviously at low stakes, you'll see some mediocre plays, which is common everywhere you go, but just relatively speaking, it's gonna be some of the tougher games that you'll find. Also, while I'm on the point, they don't have low stakes here. I mean, one three is the lowest they have. If you consider that low stakes for $500, that's okay. But for a lot of players who are starting out, they don't wanna gamble for really that much money. So you're kind of at a disadvantage if you decide to play here because unless you're an intermediate player, there's not really a game for you. All those things being said, I'd give this place an overall rating of eight out of 10. And the reason is, even though everything about the room is top notch and nothing short of amazing, game quality is a huge factor for me. And because the games aren't that good here, it's not always gonna be the best place to play. However, don't take my word for it. Let's head to the strip take advantage of that free parking, and you guys decide for yourselves.
All right, so 2-5, no limit here at the win. And one of the first things I notice when I sit down at my table is that it appears to be filled with some pretty strong players, which I guess is normal in a deep stack 2-5 game on a Wednesday afternoon in Las Vegas. So one of the adjustments I make in my head before starting to play any hands is that I'm going to try to head into this session with a bit of a more balanced approach than I otherwise might. And this is just because, one, the player pool is stronger, two, I don't know anyone's tendencies since I'm obviously not from around here, and three, you should actually try to play a little more solid when you're deep stacked just because there's a lot more money at stake. That last bit, I guess, seems kind of obvious, but that's what's going through my head right now. So bear that in mind as we jump into these next few hands. All right, in this first hand, the first two players limp in and I raise it up to $25 next to act with king queen of spades. The button calls and both of the limpers call. So 100 in the middle and four ways to a flop of ace, eight, eight with one spade. When the action checks to me, obviously I have pretty much nothing here and I'm not looking to bluff into three players. So I just check and the button checks behind. So still four ways to a turn, which is the three of spades. Action checks to me one more time. Now that I have a flush draw, and could probably still make the best hand with a king or queen, since it doesn't look like anyone has an ace at this point. I think it's okay to lead out and try to take this pot down now. I don't hate checking a second time, but I decide to bet $35, and only the under the gun limper makes the call. So heads up to a river, which is the seven of clubs, no improvement to our hand whatsoever. But when he checks it to me and I'm sitting here with king high in position, I can't help myself. I make a stab at it and try to make it look like a small value bet to a sizing of $80. Sometimes smaller bets can be perceived as stronger than bigger ones. Unfortunately, this time that does not work because he check raises to $225. So yeah, this one's over. In this next hand, there's a late position open to $20 and I get dealt five four of hearts on the button. This hand performs well as a call or a three bet. The reason it's cool as a raise is because you can represent high boards and the low boards will actually connect with your exact hand. Also, it helps you balance with hands like ace king, ace queen, aces, kings, you know, the usual stuff. However, it still obviously performs very well as a call and it's a little too soon to get that frisky. I've only been here like 15 minutes, so I'm gonna take it easy for now. I decided to just call and we go heads up to a flop of 433 with one heart. He bets $25 and I make the call. Turn card is the king of hearts giving us a flush draw now. He bets $65, kind of an annoying spot because we pick up one of those backdoor draws that just never seems to hit, but what am I gonna do, right? So I just call one more time. A five is probably not gonna do us any good here, so looking for either a heart or a four, which unfortunately does not come. It's the jack of spades, a total brick. He puts in another bet, this one to the tune of $100. I actually contemplate raising here since we should have a lot more threes than our opponent in this spot, but he still has hands like kings and jacks in his range, maybe even aces, and can we really expect a fold from aces? Another reason I'm not a huge fan of raising here is that most of our strong hands would be raising on the turn, so it just doesn't seem too credible. So I just let it go, and we're 0 for 2 so far. However, what better to cure a rough start at the poker tables than the best cocktail in Vegas, a grasshopper. For any of you guys out there who like a minty drink, make sure to try this one out. In the next one, there's an under the gun limper and I raise it up to $25 with ace 10. The small blind makes the call and the limper makes the call. So three ways to a flop of ace 10, seven rainbow. Obviously a great flop for our hand, but when they check it to me, I don't think I can get away with betting too big here since we block pretty much all the hands that they can continue with. So I bet $20 and surprisingly they both make the call. Turn card is the king of hearts. Shouldn't really change anything aside from maybe a hand like queen jack improving to a straight. But when the small blind leads for $45 and the under the gun player makes the call, I think our hand is way too strong to do anything but raise here and maximize value from hands like 8-9, which is the most obvious draw on this board, or maybe some hands that pick up a flush draw with the hearts here on the turn. So I raise it up to 175. The small blind folds, but the under the gun player makes the call. 
Given the way the hands played out here, I think it's pretty obvious my opponent has a draw in this case. So I'm bearing that in mind as we go off to a river card, which is not great. It's the six of clubs bringing in the most obvious draw on the board. If he checks it to me, I think it's gonna be a spot where I bet for value, but full to a raise. However, unfortunately for my blood pressure, he moves all in without too much thought. After getting a count, it's around $700. <sighs> These are the spots in poker which are not fun. We really don't beat anything here aside from bluffs. Is he really overvaluing a worse two pair? Seems super unlikely, especially the way the hands played out. We beat missed flush draws, but that's about it. And how many times are people really gonna have the balls to just rip it all in? once they miss a flush on the river, especially when our hand is so obviously a strong holding. It's kind of the ultimate conundrum, top of our range versus population tendencies. Maybe this seems like a really easy decision to you guys one way or the other, but for me personally, it was one of those spots that was super close and I ended up deciding on a fold because I have a hard time giving people credit for huge bluffs. It's just not something I see that often. And most people just, like I said, don't really have the nerve to go for it. But as it turns out, this opponent in particular definitely does because I get shown Jack eight of hearts. That river card in particular is one of the best for him to turn his hand into a bluff on and I'm pretty sure that my opponent knows that. So more credit to him, Brandon, nice playing with you and nice hand. But for all you guys out there who say I'm a calling station, payoff wizard, or what have you, you're definitely not wrong, but it's hands like these that make me never wanna make big folds in live poker. <sighs> As if that hand wasn't dramatic enough already, this next one is right up there with it. There's two limpers and I make it $30 on the button with pocket sixes. The big blind and second limper make the call. So three ways in position to a flop of nine, four, six. Oh yeah, action checks to me and I like to bet $45. The big blind does not fold or call. He gives us some good news in the form of a check raise. He makes it 125 to go. The other player folds and I happily make the call here in position. Turn card isn't great, it's the ace of diamonds. And the reason I say that is because my opponent in this hand is a pretty solid player who I think will be check raising top pair some percentage of the time. So I expect this card to somewhat slow down the action if he did have a nine. But aside from that, it doesn't make too much difference for our exact hand because we're just gonna keep shoveling money in the middle as much as we can. This time he slows down and checks it to me and I decide to size up a little bit here simply because I suspect my opponent's perception of me to be that I'm angry and upset after getting bluffed out of my shoes that last hand even though I'm actually not upset at all. It's kind of hard to be annoyed when you're in Vegas sipping a grasshopper but my opponents don't know that so I put in a bet of $300 hoping it looks like a bluff and luckily my opponent thinks for a while and makes the call. So we got some action here going to the river and the river's actually much better than the turn card. It's the ace of spades, making it much less likely that I have an ace, which hopefully induces my opponent to call down a little bit lighter here. He checks and I have around $670 left in my stack at this point. Given how big the pot is, I think there's only one play that makes sense here and that is all in which is exactly what I do. And my opponent goes in the tank for quite a while here, thinks and thinks and thinks it over some more before eventually deciding on a call. That's gonna be good news. I turn it over and indeed we have the winning hand. I was just starting to think we weren't gonna win a pot here, but given the size of this one, I think that makes up for how the session's been going so far here at the Encore. A few minutes later, 
I get dealt King Queen of Diamonds, first to act, I bet 20 bucks, and then a player in middle-ish position raises it to $60. Action folds back to me, and I decide to make the call. The flop comes down Queen Jack 7 with two hearts. I check, and my opponent continues for $60. Nothing to do here but make the call, so that's what I do. And we see a 7 of hearts on the turn, completing the flush draw. I check, and he bets $100 this time. Not loving it, but not really hating it. I think I want to call one more time and see what happens. So I throw in the 100, and we're off to a river, which is a complete blank, the deuce of clubs. The pot's around 450 now. I check it to him a third time, and he puts in a bet of $475, which is obviously a pretty large bet. And I'm pretty done with the hand at this point. I'm going to have a lot of better hands to call with, given how the hands played out. Occasionally, I'll have hands like ace queen, some flushes, maybe even pocket kings at some frequency. So, king queen suited seems a bit too weak to call down here, especially for the price we're getting. So, even though I'll be getting bluffed sometimes, since my opponent in this case is a pretty solid player, I decide to let it go and not overthink it too much. In the next fun hand, the cutoff limps in, and I look down at the beautiful aces on the button. Raise it up to $25. Both of the blinds make the call and the limper calls as well. So four ways to a flop here of 664 rainbow. When the action checks to me, I think I want to protect my checking range here, which is something I don't do too often. Typically against weaker opposition, I just always bet my strong hands and check when I miss. But because both of the players and the blinds in this game are pretty solid players, I think I want to stay a bit more balanced and a little disguised here as well. So I check it back and we go four ways to a turn, which is the three of diamonds. The small blind leads out on this card for $50. The big blind folds. Cutoff makes the call and I think I have a pretty clear call here. Raising seems a bit too thin and it doesn't make too much sense after checking back the flop. So I make the call. Three ways to a river, which is the eight of hearts. Small blind leads out again for $100. Interestingly enough, the cutoff makes the call once again. And at this point, I think I have a pretty clear call. Raising seems a bit too ambitious to get called by worse. Especially being this deep, it would be a disaster to raise and get re-raised by the small blind. If we only had like maybe $100 or $200 behind, then... I think it's fine, but we have at least $1,000 left in our stack, so I decide to just overcall and get to showdown. The small blind flips over, pocket nines, the cutoff mucks his cards, and we turn over the winner. I'm happy with how this hand turned out, although it was a bit unconventional, but deep stacked against some solid players, it's nice to mix it up sometimes. One orbit later, the cutoff opens to $15, and I look down at red eights on the button. I think you could go either way between raising and calling here. The fact that this raises a relatively small size and from a player in late position makes me want to re-raise, but the fact that my opponent is probably 80 or 90 years old and drinking some hot coffee makes me just want to call, so that's what I do this time. But it seems the big blind disagrees with that because he raises it up to $60. The cutoff makes the fold and I have a pretty clear continue here in position. Flop comes down 10, 9, 4, rainbow and my opponent continues for $60. Nothing to do here but just call. I expect him to bet his entire range here and we're still ahead of a lot of those hands. And if we weren't, the turn card definitely changes that in the 8 of spades. Unfortunately this time he slows down and checks which mostly confirms my suspicions that he has either ace king or ace queen something like that but in case he is pot controlling with an over pair I'm going to go for some value here so I make it $115 no love for this set of eights after my opponent folds pretty quickly after around 5 hours of playing through the ups and the downs, I decided to rack up and call it a session.
Okay, so for those of you guys who are avid watchers of this channel, you'll have noticed that you haven't seen me in two, maybe three weeks. And there's good reason for that. But before I get into all that drama, I wanted to touch on a few things. Number one is the results for the session. I ended up winning almost $1,000 in around five and a half hours, which all things considered is a great result for me. Secondly, I played one three no limit the following day, also at the win. But the main purpose of this, despite me losing a few hundred dollars, was to hang out with Jeff Boski, who invited us to hang out with him for the night, play some poker, and then took us to the Cosmopolitan where we enjoyed some dinner and I tried one of the best cocktails. In fact, one of the most interesting cocktails, I should say, that I've ever tried. Highly recommend you guys give this one a try if you're ever at the Cosmo. But yeah, overall it was a great time and I just wanted to give him a quick shout out for the hospitality. Anyway, I owe you guys an explanation as to where I've been the past few weeks and kind of what's been going on. And it's really all about YouTube. Me, I've just been doing my thing, wanting to make more vlogs for you guys, but unfortunately there's a bug going around YouTube which is an automated algorithm issue. They're taking down a lot of gambling vlogs, not just poker, but also like slot machine channels and blackjack channels. Apparently something about our videos is flagging the YouTube algorithm. But when you look at our videos, they're not actually against any of the policy for which they're being flagged. So it seems to just be some sort of error. The problem is YouTube's customer service is subpar, to put it nicely. So all of us vloggers who have been trying to get our issues fixed just haven't really heard back from YouTube and we've kind of just been in the dark as to where our channels lie. I've received two strikes on my channel due to this issue and some other victims include Andrew Nimi, Brad Owen, Ryan DePaulo, Jeff Boski, and I'm sure a few others. And there really hasn't been much resolution. I appealed all my videos and strikes to YouTube and luckily within 24 hours, the issue was fixed. But for some others like Andrew and Ryan, they've done the same process but haven't achieved the same result. It's a pretty frustrating situation because none of us are doing anything wrong but we're still getting our videos taken down. However, because my strikes have been removed, the show goes on, at least for me. I intend to continue to make these vlogs once or twice a week for you guys. And speaking of that, the very next vlog is gonna be from Harris, which you guys might remember, I made vlog number, oh, actually I'm not even gonna pretend to know what number this was, but you'll see it right here. It was one of my most popular videos in which I got my ass kicked. So I figured why not go back and seek some redemption and make a vlog out of it. Speaking of new content, I have a big announcement for you guys. I'll be heading to Texas next month with none other than Johnny Vibes himself. Here are the details for the trip. We're partnering up for a meetup game in Houston as well as Austin. So if you guys are local to the area and wanna come out for a good time, make sure to join us on these dates at these locations where we'll be playing some poker and just having fun. And who knows, you might just make the vlog. All right, that's it for this episode. I'm done rambling now. I'm gonna get to editing all this footage get some sleep, and hopefully run good tomorrow at Jerez. Next time you see me, it'll be from that location, so stay tuned for that video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for all the support. If you gave this video a thumbs up, I really appreciate that. It helps the channel grow. And I'll see you guys soon. Good luck at the tables. Peace.